guess we can go ahead and get started. We're waiting for, uh, for one more colleague, but she'll walk in, I imagine, in, in a moment. So, uh, welcome everyone. Um, this is Ask the Roni Psychologist, and uh, I, I see a lot of familiar faces from our, our gathering yesterday. Uh, this will this is a little different, and what will happen is we're each going to uh, take just a moment to uh, introduce ourselves and make a couple of comments, and then we'll ask anybody who has a question, and it can be about our research, it can be about people's reactions to the, to the fandom or the fandom in general, or what's the meaning of life, you know. Uh, what do you do? <laughs> Uh, and if you have a question, though, then we'll ask you to line up, and it works best that we just simply take one person after another, so we're not having to pick people's raised hands and that. So, and uh, we'll just simply spend the time trying to answer as many of your questions as we uh, as we can. In that, um, I will start by um, introducing myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Pat Edwards. Uh, I'm a PhD clinical psychologist. I also go by the, the my OC pony is Dr. Psychology. And uh, we will continue to remind you also, if you haven't visited our website, bronystudy.com, please do. We post, um, we post our results there so you can see a lot of what we found on the surveys. And we also kind of note upcoming events that we're going to be attending or interviews that have been posted. Uh, we're doing lots and lots of, of interviews of that. Um, I did, I wanted to mention one thing. It might come up in a question, but I, I wanted to uh, just sort of uh, make note of it. And yesterday, I thanked you all. And we, we keep doing this. We keep thanking the herd because uh, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for uh, your dedication to the fandom and your willingness to kind of step forward. You took the risk of letting these psychologists come into your midst and ask questions. And I think what you found is, you know, we're not here to make you look bad. We're, uh, we report what we find. And what we found speaks wonderfully of you all as a group. So uh, again, we'd like to thank you. I'd also like to thank you from, for a number of other people. We have talked to parents, we have talked to reporters, we have talked to people who produce movies, and they all tend to say the th same thing. They are extremely surprised by this fandom. You all make these things possible. Your, your approach to life, your approach to each other, your openness, your love and tolerance, uh, make this happen, and it, and it really makes it possible. So it's not just us as researchers, but there are a lot of people uh, who um, need to be giving you credit. I do want to mention one other thing, because uh, I think people make some certain assumptions, and um, we thank you for helping us out. There wouldn't be a Brony study. But also, if it wasn't for who you are, if it wasn't for the positive nature of that, we might not be as likely to do this, because we are not paid anything to do this. When I checked out from the hotel, I had to pay the whole bill myself. We don't have a grant. We receive no reimbursement. The con's not paying us. We do this out of our own pocket. And I think partly because we, too, are struck by the fandom and the positive nature of it and, and that. So um, there are a lot of people responding very positively to what you all have created. And so again, I thank you and we thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Chadbourne. I have a master's in psychology. Uh, my OC is Professor Euconium. Um, and it's a very unpopular and never updated Tumblr blog if you don't want to follow me. Um, uh, my uh, research interests have really uh, varied. I've dealt in everything from social and developmental psychology. My master's thesis was on the evolution of the, the mind, creative behaviors, uh, and shamanism. Um, uh, so uh, in addition to that, um, I, I kind of bring the sort of brony side uh, to the group. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of very involved in the fandom, like Dr. Edwards. I'm, I'm up to date on all the episodes. 
and I try to keep up with a little more of the social media and even even the drama uh, within, just to kind of keep up with what's going on uh, with the fandom. Uh, good morning, I'm Jan Griffin, and I'm the newest member of the team, and I'm Dr. Significant. And of course, I love this because I'm kind of a wingy person, so the team had a bet on how long was it before I get ears. I would have wings, but I didn't have green wings that goes along with my character. I'm the um, sort of scientific statistical person. I'm the one that writes up the research for presentation at our professional conferences. And as um, Dr. Edwards has mentioned uh, several times, we've presented at least at eight different um, venues, and those are eight different studies, and those are different than what we talked about yesterday. So we have a wide variety of data. The information is presented on our website, thebronystudy.com, but we'll also be writing up an article um, for our professional journal, which of course will put information um, as a link into our website. But um, this has really been fun for me. I've taught for over 35 years, and my colleagues that are my age are all retiring, and people ask me, you know, aren't you going to retire? And I'm like, are you kidding me? I've gotten my five kids raised, they're grown, they're out of the house. Now I can do what I love, which is research on cool topics. So thank you very much. You've been very welcoming. I also am the one who goes around and takes a lot of the pictures. We'll have collages on the website, and I love it. Thank you so much for a wonderful I'm Marsha Radden. I'm a clinical psychologist and I am retired after over 30 years in private practice. I've taught for a little while and now I'm really fully retired. Uh, I still maintain my license, but you've got to go really cry on the phone for me to, do, for me to see me. <laughs> Dr. Edwards and I got this study started in 2011 and we have just been blown away by the response that we get. And we certainly do thank each and every one of you, your parents, your therapists, uh, your friends, those who have, have supported you, and you who have supported us in this experiment. Um, we are going from collect, just simply collecting data to uh, a real full experiment on before and after with some college students. That's going to be the thing we do in the fall. Uh, so we're all moving forward and we are diversifying in some ways. Um, I have three grandchildren and um, I am disappointed that Granny Smith is not one of the major tokens. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, why don't we, I guess, do we have a staff person here? <coughs> okay, why don't we form the line over here? So if you have a question, go get in line over here. Also, let me mention while they're forming up, uh, Dr. Griffin, Jan, this is her first BronyCon, and we were joking last night, it's like, how are we going to take her back to Spartanburg, South Carolina after she's seen <laughs> Bro BronyCon? You know, it's very hard for us to go back. It's very hard for us yeah, to go back, to go back yeah. after this. Yeah. Our students are never this excited. <laughs> my husband's downstairs buying growing stuff for my granddaughter as we speak. Where do you see both the fandom and the show going from here? Um, well, I mean, I've heard rumors that, that Hasbro is talking about extending out like five seasons or so. And I guess my, my feeling is as long as the show is 
being produced. I, I think there will be bromines and also as long as Hasbro doesn't change things too much. But of course it will have to change. And we don't want to see the same static thing in five years. But my suspicion is the fandom, what we've seen, look at how many people are here compared just to last year. I, I suspect the fandom will continue to grow. It seems to be getting younger. We're seeing a lot more younger fans uh, than that. So that's my thing. Anybody else? Um, I, I think when it comes to uh, the amount of consumption, I, I think earnings are almost directly responsible for the quality, the variety of the toys that Hasbro is producing. And Hasbro being a major company that's really about profits, as long as Bronies are consuming, the show's probably going to keep going on because Bronies are going to keep consuming. And, and so I, I don't see it, personally, I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon because I mean, it's, it's probably the biggest thing Hasbro has to offer right now. Well, another thing mm -hmm. is that you don't see Star Trek movies anymore. Uh, they're doing reruns on television, but you've still got trackers. So, you know, I mean, the first law of science is future resembles the past. So, uh, I would expect this to go on, that there will, there will always be some problems. It may not be this big. But I think we're a, long, we're a couple years away from that. Yeah, I think we're a couple years away from that. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I think Grady Smith rocks. <laughs> I uh, really appreciate the work you guys do. I'm actually a sociology major, so I completely get all of this. Um, one thing I'm curious about is what you said about how you guys don't get grants or anything for this. Is there a pushback you feel from uh, for studies of this nature? Because Personally, I feel when you get involved in a fandom like this and you see just the positive nature, there's so much that people can learn about just the positivity and the acceptance. So it's one of those things of like, what does it take? It is this pushback to get that reality out there that there is a lot that can be learned. Well, let me tell you, um, the first presentation that we made was in 2012 of uh, the American Medical Psychiatric Association. It was a meeting sponsored by the American Medical Psychiatric Association. And they asked us to submit our presentation for publication. They could not find anyone to edit. Nobody wanted to touch it. Yeah, I think, that, and I personally think this is probably in four or five years, I'll be thanking the Bronies again, because we have found their, the, the field of fandoms in general have been, has just been ignored by social sciences, psychology, sociology, and we are really breaking ground. And I think because of uh, your readiness to come forward, share with us, and because of what we're finding, we're hoping that this will lead our field to begin to take more seriously. Because I think in five or ten years, we need internet fandoms that are pro-social. We need groups that are promoting positive uh, behaviors and attitudes. And so our hope is, is that we're breaking the ice and that then other social scientists will take notice and start, they won't hear fandom and think deviant. They'll hear a fandom and say, we need to hear, we need to study this more. Um, I think also, we all come from a small, usually from small universities. Um, we're all from small universities, and we all chose to go into the field of teaching. And we love research, so we do research. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we have our clinical person who actually made money. The rest of us are professors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, who teach. And so we love this so much. We, we do it, and we're making an impact. But we're not at the kind of university that could probably get a big grant to do this. Um, usually you need graduate students. 
And it, it, that takes time, and quite frankly, you know, I'd kind of be the person to do it. I don't want to take the time away from contact with you guys and doing the research to get the money. I mean, we're willing to put the bill as much as we're able to do because we love it.
Um, and one of the things that that does is it uh, it keeps the data from being too skewed by the, the much older brownies. And we love the much older brownies, and we do look at their data, but we don't necessarily put it into the data pool with the analysis. There is a difference uh, somewhat based upon the typology in that we tend to see the younger bronies come in more heavily in the social brony group. They're, they're, they're ongoing and they're, often they're making it a very important part of their life and, and that. Whereas some of the older bronies tend to fall a little more in the, the hipster group where it's important but they're not necessarily finding guidance and they may not make it a central part of their life. And it would make sense from an identity standpoint that, that someone who's older who's already gone through that sort of identity development has a pretty clear sense of where their identity lies. That, that it's, it's a part of it, but it might not be that central focus. And that's they, why they might end up in that sort of independent or history. They may literally have their brony suit in the closet and they take it out at times and wear it, but they don't wear it all the time because other times they have their doctor's outfit on or their mother outfit on. Hi, thank you for coming down, first of all. Um, oh, I have more of a comment than a question. Okay. Um, I have three favorite ponies, Pinkie Pie, Fluttershy, and Rarity. And I think those three match my personality the best. Um, I'm shy like Fluttershy, but I can be very excitable about things like Pinkie Pie. And I think I should be Rarity because I'm a sketch artist, so there's a Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to know what you guys think of that. Well, we think it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and I think yesterday we stressed that with our studies and our data, we, we talk about, you know, 50,000 bronies and here's kind of what you see. But I keep stressing that each of you is unique and special and th there are always going to be people who will like different combinations of ponies for different reasons. And that's totally okay. You know that. Um, I do think that you stress the one thing we tend to find, people usually choose ponies because they identify with them. You know, you, you see, you just see more than one pony, you see three. But the other thing is that you, you sound like you are really getting to know yourself really well. And that's cool. Just as a note, I like to see myself as it's Rainbow Dash, but when I've taken those Who's Your Favorite Pony quizzes online, and I've taken them multiple times, tried to change the answers and multiple <laughs> quizzes, I come out every time Applejack. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I, I really do identify with Pinkie Pie, but I come from Rarity. Whoa. Now, wait a minute. Let me tell you that that thing has never been validated. <laughs> <laughs> and as scientists, we look at it and chuckle. So, you know, it's cool, it's fun, but it ain't scientific. <laughs> okay, yeah, I want to find out who did it and do the reliability and validity and scientific analysis. <laughs> And he told me he was a brony. And I said, a what? 
And then he called me and I said, you got to be kidding me. And, uh, but he says, Dad, it's a big thing on the internet. I went on, I was surprised, you know, with the artistic work. I was surprised with a lot of what I was with the art. So I told Dr. Redden, and we both kind of had that Twilight Sparkle, we must science this immediately. <laughs> and so the first thing I did was look at the literature, nothing. You know, nothing about, nothing about fandoms. So I found four bronies and I did an in-depth kind of couple hours interview with each. And one of the things that surprised me that I never would have guessed was the WWPD. What would a pony do? The guidance function. And uh, then I watched the episode and that's when I realized these are parables. They always have a positive, moral message there. And so that's what, that's what started it. Our, our colleagues said, no one will do your survey. We put it up, I put it up on Equestria Daily. Within a week, we had close to 5,000 subjects and people were salivating and couldn't believe it. You know, and we were off and running. So again, it was the fandom's response. Although I do have to mention this, the very first BronyCon that we went to and I presented, it wasn't easy to convince the BronyCon people to let me present. They they kept saying, we don't know, scientists come in, you always screw things up. You know? <laughs> and I had to I'd give them the data, I had to, finally they said, okay. <laughs> and of course, like we got a standing ovation, and then they realized, these people are scientists. We're not coming in biased, we're not trying to make you look bad. And that's the rest of history. And it's not just the Brony community being cautious. Uh, we've started reaching out to some other fandoms, and, and I remember uh, one I guess, sort of gatekeeper for that fandom. I went back and forth with three long emails. But let me go through every one of these questions that you have because there were a couple of books written in the 70s and the 80s and it weren't very nice, and there were some, some, some people who would come in and have mess. And I don't think any, any psychologist, maybe, maybe some marketing, some communication. Nothing against marketing but there were um but but there there was this worry and then there there was and I don't think there is anyone in the Brownie community. Um, and again what we've seen with with the family seems to be really positive, especially with Brownie community. Very positive. Mm -hmm. As the show continues and there's two parallel tracks. There's new episodes and then there's new uh, inventions by the Brony community. As a relatively new Brony, I found myself sometimes uh, confused or ostracized. The first time I ever heard the term grim or the first time I ever heard about a black and red unicorn or, or alicorn, I still don't understand why that makes everyone laugh. How do you deal with, as the, as the fandom grows, not alienating the Bronies? I think part of that, especially with the idea of maybe not knowing sort of grim dark and, and things like that, there's a lot of fandom terminology that's not exclusive to the Brony community. Um, and, and it might be a thing more to say about fandom in general than just Brony. So I will have to say that, that from what I've seen, the Brony community tends to be far more open, accepting, and willing to sort of explain and take people in than some of the other fandoms might, who might be very you're not a real fan unless you know all of this background information from this anime that are only been on for two episodes. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it can be very difficult. That's, that's a, a, a big issue with new fans coming in. I'm always a little late to, you know, finally sit down and start watching something. Um, and in trying to avoid spoilers or, or not knowing some little bit of information can be... And, and I think that also really depends on the person that you talk to and the people you engage with. And I think a, a good brony, a, a good fan of, of anything, should be willing to sit down with someone and go, yeah, you know, this is what we mean by this, this is what we mean by that. Because even then, give it five years, and those terminologies will become something else. They'll change different tropes and names. Don't, don't make fun of them and call them a noob. Educate them. Yeah, and you know, and one of the things that you could do would be to say, look, I'm new to the fan, and could you explain this to me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if they want to, if they want to laugh and, and, and maybe get angry about it, maybe they're not the type of fan we want to associate with in the community. We'll we'll go find someone nice to be friends with. Yeah, and and uh, 
Hi. Um, first off, I'd just like to say thank you for your research. Um, this and your panel last year is one of the major reasons I'm now open brownie as opposed to secret brownie. So thank you very much. If right now, do you have any data about what aspects in a fandom, social, um, what the sort of thing that started the fandom is and so on and so forth, do you have anything uh, about what keeps a fandom going? Like the key features in the social community, what makes sure that a fandom continues to grow and uh, sustain itself? And if so, like what sort of things are those? I guess I would have to say, just in general, and, and as a clinician, I, I'm kind of talking to not just fandoms, but anything. I mean, if you say, well, why does somebody stay in a relationship? Why does somebody live in a certain area? We would say it's because it, it meets some need, it has some function for them. And so I guess I'd say in general, as long as my little that uh, continues to meet the, the needs the fans have, they'll stay connected with it. And also, but I think part of it is the fan dumb. Some of you are here not because of the cartoon, you're here because of each other. I mean, we meet, I meet bronies who never even watch the cartoon, but they go to every meetup and convention they can find. And so I think as long as it continues to meet needs, and I think one of the things that the fandom does, since it's very open, open and, and accepting, is there's always going to be a need, especially for adolescents and young adults, that need communities where it's safe where they can get on and they can feel like it's safe. And sadly, we see in the news where sometimes individuals aren't in that situation and drastic, desperate things happen. So um, I think as long as the fandom at, at continues to be, and I see no reason why it won't. I, um, and I don't expect Hasbro to change the cartoon in drastic ways uh, or anything like that. So. I just had a question because yesterday um, you were talking about the female bronies and how they're more likely to be bisexual and I was a little confused. Is it more so because bronies are open to new experiences or because of the general age group of the female bronies? You said they were more open to experimentation. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, yeah. one thing just to recognize, and I know my colleagues will talk more, is it's what we call correlational data, and that means we can't draw causal relationships, so we can't say one factor causes the other, they just tend to occur together. And that's just looking at a snapshot of what the female bronies look like. So, so five, 500 uh, female bronies, I mean, which, I mean, could be the substantial sample size, but still in the long run is a small percentage of the total number uh, of female fans. Also, I'd like to just kind of point, and, and I reminded people, you, you know, you need to look at this. One of the things when I look at that data we presented about the female bronies, I look at it and say, they're open, they're exploring, they look in breadth, they look in depth. And that's something we need to reinforce because all too often, I know, given my age and, and as a male, we were incredibly limited as to what we could explore, what we could question, you know, about ourselves and that. So I think it's good that that's available and that the female bronies are, are making use of it. And there may also be a big difference in that self-report between male and female bronies as, as a group because when you take the bronies as a whole, some of those numbers shift a little bit. Um, and with the, the, the difference between the male and female bronies, you might actually see more of it with the male bronies, but there may not be a reporting because of what you're expected to go into, uh, what you're expected to, you know, or, or the stereotypes, the norms that, 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 that males are supposed to sort of inhabit in this sort of concept of masculinity. Um, whether or not it's more acceptable for a male versus a female to identify as bisexual or homosexual or even asexual. Um, and that might even skew a lot of the results. You get a very open to new experience group as a whole, 
but <clears throat> there may be some differences in how the male and females uh, would respond solely because of the social dynamics, not a brony community, but of the, the, the US community, the world community, and how they're accepting, how our outside communities are sort of accepting of, of how we can respond and how we can act. Um, you can kind of say that that may be difference in neuroticism between male and females that we see in general might just be from a willingness that it's much easier for uh, a female to say that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling these emotions, I'm feeling worry, I'm feeling you know a little high strung today, but it's not as acceptable for, for a male in for general society to say, I'm really stressed out today, or I'm just only crying for no reason. Um, it, it becomes a little more difficult, and that might even be where we see that shit. Um, so that social aspect of it. And another thing is that some of these uh, these factors that we found, for instance, neuroticism, it doesn't matter if you're a brony or not. The data shows that women score higher in neuroticism than they do than men do. Uh, women uh, tend to score a little bit higher in extroversion than men do. Uh, there's just you know one of the things that you have to, that we also have to do is compare this to the to what we call the normal population or the general population. So uh, in many ways, bronies do not differ. And it's also really cool to note that bronies as a whole typically score lower on neuroticism than the general population, than non bronies mm -hmm. So less anxiety, less work. I mean, you start dividing the group up. But as a whole, there are these really cool differences um, that do set bronies apart from non bronies. Okay. In regards to um, personality disorders like GAD and PTSD, have you seen the fandom help somebody overcome some of these, uh, these issues, like with anxiety and stress, and this, that, and the other? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you said personality disorders, I, I, we just finished our How the Fandom Changed My Life survey. Um, and in fact, that data is up, and I really suggest if you haven't seen it, go look at it because um, it's very pronounced that the fandom has a very positive impact, uh, particularly on depression, which is kind of the common cold of mental illnesses and, and that, uh, anxiety. Um, but also we see uh, attention deficit, Asperger's, which actually, you know, the term's been taken out of the, the DSM, but um, in that those things, uh, I think the individuals gain a lot because of the acceptance and the ability that a fandom gives them to develop friends and explore. explore. I don't know about PTSD. In general, the personality disorders, people did not self-report those. Well, right, PTSD is an anxiety, but I was going to say that the personality disorders, we did not get a lot of reports of those within the population. One of the other things is we did not specifically ask questions about personality disorders, and I'm in the process of putting that together. Well, the reason I ask is because I, I have PTSD and I also have GAD, and it's helped me out in a lot of ways. Exactly. That's why I ask. Is because it's yeah, all of the newest survey. We, we do have a, um, a lot of individuals who, who, who say, and then I think it was a very high majority of the percentage who said that, that they had been diagnosed with we had a couple of, uh, depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, and there were a very high percentage that said, yes, the fandom, my, my symptoms have improved since I joined the fandom. Oh, yes, please <clears throat> fill out the survey. The other thing, love your story. The other thing is that um, I have been collecting stories about uh, people who have have had experienced changes in their lives, some positive, some negative, because of the brain abandonment. And so, if any of you all have a story to tell and you have not emailed me. You can either go to fandomchangemylife at gmail.com or you can just go to bronystudy at gmail.com. Um, I'm collecting those and um, they are going to be used. However, everything will remain anonymous.
that let me just do one thing very quick for that. My, my wife, this happened about a year ago, was sitting in an airport and a young woman sat down next to her and they started talking. The young woman works at a, uh, a residential facility for troubled teenage boys and they got to talking and my wife said, have you by any chance heard of the Bronies and My Little Pony? And the person sort of smiled and chuckled and said, they gave us an in-service on how to use My Little Pony to help the residents. So, Well, you've uh, made mention several times of kind of the negative reaction that you received from uh, your colleagues and people in your field. I was wondering what uh, has changed uh, when you've actually shown them the data that you've shown us here growing up. They, they usually get really quiet real quick. <laughs> <laughs> you're them. Yeah. 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 Mine have been, mine have been just very impressed. Not just colleagues, but relatives, friends, others. You know, first they laugh. You know, like, you gotta be kidding me. And then they are like, you know, they ask the typical thing. I don't, and that to me is an intriguing question. Why do people say, very first thing, are they gay or pedophiles? I, you know, I really would like to understand the other people's responses and get data from them about what's going on. But once I begin to explain it, it really changes. And we're looking at that also with our introductory students in changing and seeing what are their initial attitudes, then exposing them to an episode so they get to watch it, and then the, see the what are their attitudes the after. Yeah. Uh, something else is that in the in March, we uh, Dr. Edwards and I took, um, took two posters to the Southeast Psychological Association in Nashville. We had lines standing up to talk to us from uh, students and colleagues, you know, from other schools. The pe one of the, uh, the women who had the poster right across from me said, if you ever come back, I am not going to be across from you because nobody ever came to talk to me. <laughs> so we had we had a lot of interest. And next, um, uh, this coming Friday, we're taking another poster to the American Psychological Association, and this will be the first, for as far as we know, the first uh, the first time that anything about Bronies has gone to that level. You may have got a little bit of a sense from, from this. We empathize with what you all go through because I feel like in many ways it's the same thing with, I mean, when we tell our colleagues we get this like negative blowback. And it's a little sad because, you know, we like to think scientists, we're objective, and, but everybody brings their biases into it. And so we are in the process, just like you are with family and friends and others, of educating people and watching as they go, whoa. And then some of them will watch and some of them will probably come away and become brilliant, you know. So um, we're going through the same process that you all through. I will, I will mention, um, in addition to the Southeast, uh, I presented two posters to the Southwest Psychological Association in April, so right after they did. And it was the same situation. We not only had a crowd, but we had more, I can probably go and count the number of participants on all the other student and faculty posters, and I think combined, we had as many as everyone else did. Um, and and I, I had a, co a colleague I worked with at my university afterwards said, so the, this friend I know in the developmental psych community messaged me and said that she ran into you and had to go back to her hotel room and watch a couple of episodes. <laughs> so, while we, get, while we may get some sort of iffy, you know, eyes and, and wondering why we're doing this, there are a lot of people in the community who once they see the data, really go, oh, so this is pretty serious, and this is something we can actually look at. I mean, this is this is good. Okay, I have one one more comment. Um, we worked with a student, 
Dr. Edwards and I work most closely with the student um, in doing the research, and she put together her own poster and presented it at our university. It was with other students from other universities in the upstate of South Carolina, and there were probably 75 to 80, and I mean, they had mathematicians, they had economists, they had biochemists, and all sorts of areas of posters. She won the best poster. Mostly utopian society. 
right? <laughs> but evidently there's this idea of femininity wrapped up inside that show. What do you think of that? I know I'm just bringing it on you. I've heard that argument before. Yeah. I keep up with a lot of the uh, online groups, and some of them are uh, much less nice than saying it in that. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, it, it might be sort of the idea that I mean, I know, I know what I know about the sort of gender gender norms that we've looked at. Like what we found is, is that when it comes to gender trait stereotyping and gender role stereotyping, so what roles men, men and women should do, what traits are masculine and feminine. While there are some differences within the community, if you take all the female bronies and all the male bronies, female bronies are going to be less gender stereotyped. But I made it important to note, because this is some of the data we presented at one of the, the conferences, is that while there are some differences within the community, if you take all of the bronies and compare this to non-bronies, bronies are less likely to use gender trait stereotyping, less likely to use gender role stereotyping, either masculine or feminine. You know, the other thing is that feminism does not mean that you can't be feminine. between the sort of masculine and feminine traits generally benefit from a wide array of positive psychological uh, effects. Um, and I think the ponies tend to show, you, you have, you know, Apple Jack and Rainbow Dash who show a lot of what we would call, I mean, not masculine, we don't call masculine and feminine anymore, it's an expressiveness and instrumentality. They tend to show a pretty good mix. Um, while they are female characters, they, they don't, you know, it's not, it's not so sort of overly feminine, you can argue, um, that there's this balance there. And again, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to say, well, I'm a feminist, but that, that means I can't be feminine. It's like saying I'm a man and I can't be a little feminine. I can't cry every now and then. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, in my, my theory of watching both the explosion of running fandom and blowback against it is that it's more of a perfect storm in challenging male gender role. I figured that like, Kim Possible came to mind that said the same thing, but like, My Little Pony, that had more of an impact to it. I was wondering, in your studies, if you found, you might research on that, on the, the effects on men in the fandom, and also in the larger society, if you've seen more of a challenge of the male gender identity, like, like you said, with the, uh, back at the feminine, feminist movement, how that started to <coughs> as if you now start to see the male side of that change. Well, I think that there was a perception of the roles of men change, of uh, masculinity changing. Uh, I don't know that it, it in fact changed. I think that that may have been a perception. Uh, if you go to YouTube, there is a brief PBS uh, presentation on uh, the new masculinity. And they talk about how um, they talk about how uh, perceptions of masculinity are changing. One of the things that I see that's very positive is that it opens up a lot of avenues. When you talk about changes in gender roles, it opens up a lot of avenues for people to be who they are and to be happy. Um, you know, I don't think I would have been happy as a stay-at-home mom. I worked for, you know, my whole time. My daughter would not be happy as a stay-at-home mom. Uh, I had a, a mom who worked and she wasn't happy as a stay-at-home mom. You know, but it, I think that um, there's a difference between the reality and the perception. And let me tell you that when you try and tease that out scientifically, you're going to get a headache. I think we're down to about five minutes. Yeah. So maybe we we'll maybe take. We will. When we're done, we'll be outside so we can field more questions. Five minutes. So let's take one more. And I have a little statement I wanted to make. Um, um, there's a lot of talk. In this fandom, and in fandoms in general, there's a lot of 
uh, it's fairly obvious, at least it seems to me as a lay person, that people use this very often with things like OCs, who is my favorite pony, what pony do I most resemble, they use this almost to resolve identity purposes. And I wonder, is there, and some people may think of me as a bad guy and for asking this question, is there a possibility that retreating too far into a pony identity, an OC, or you know, one of the main six, or whoever, is it possible that retreating too far into that could actually be psychologically harmful for someone? And please, everyone keep in mind, I have a big Macintosh hat too. Well, I guess what I would say is that with anything, with anything, even things that can be wonderfully good. If you go too far into it, you it, there's always that possibility, you know, you can lose friends, you can disconnect from uh, your job, you can you, you can become too obsessed. Moderation. Moderation I think is usually the, the, the proper path to take. And I would have said the same thing. So. That's the clinician part. Listen, I, I wanted to, and again, we want to thank you all profusely. We will be outside, so you can come and catch us with other questions. But I did want to make one comment, because uh, I had several people come up and ask me, uh, and I was waiting to see if we'd get a question. And for those of you who didn't get to ask your question, I, I'm sorry, uh, but thanks for getting up. But um, we sometimes ask, whether it is always a good idea to tell people that you're a brony, you know, should you, you know, should, especially, you know, young people, old people, should you always stand up and say, I'm a brony, live with it? The answer that I would give as a clinician is, it's not always a good idea. That you really have to take into account the reaction that you're going to get. Um, because there's sometimes, and I think we see it, some individuals may disclose it and unexpectedly get so much blowback that they don't possibly know how to handle it and what to do with it. So um, I think it's the kind of thing that you need to talk with people, particularly parents. You know, it's great if their children can tell them and you can talk with them and you can be supportive. But you, you need to think about it before you kind of jump up and tell people because it can have some, some blowback and some people are not ready. As a clinician, I have people at times tell me their secrets and say, should I tell others? And sometimes I'm saying, yeah, it's time, tell your parents. And other times, not yet. You know, you need to do some more preparation for it. So I just wanted to share that with you because that's a question that I, I had. Um, I had um, uh, a, a talk to a couple of people and just very briefly with this, talk to a couple of people about something similar. When we talk about the types of bronies, we have secret bronies, high guidance, but no disclosure. We're not telling anyone they are. Um, and, and they made the comment that, you know, we argue that these secret bronies are secret out of necessity and not choice. And I would argue that any secret brony, you know, anyone who's getting that guidance on uh, is, is, is not getting it out of choice. It's because there's some factor they can have their parents and it's their boss, they can it might not be okay to come up to their friends. And it might not be it might just be a not yet. Um, and as the burning community becomes becomes more accepting, I think that, that willingness to do so will be more likely.